I mean, I, I think it's, at least for us, I'll, I'll just speak for, you know, my personal philosophy, which is, you know, we've been at this for 10 years and, um, and, and certainly refining the existing process and the existing buy box and, and doing more of the same is, is great. But I, I, I like, you know, how Tony Robbins kind of uses the, the, the concept of if you're not growing, then you're, you're dying. You're not, I mean, you're shrinking. Um, so we're always trying to up the game, right? That's, that's an important part of what we do. But um, for, for us, I think it's, it's, it's also about just continually building the skill set, right? It's always trying to learn more, ask great questions, get a team around you that, that to where it's like Les Brown talks about, uh, you know, if you're the smartest guy or gal in the room, you're in the, you know, you're in the wrong room. You got, you got to really surround yourself with people. And that's what I love to do is I don't like to necessarily go and talk about like what I know in the note business. I, I really, a great conversation for me is when I'm asking somebody questions and they're telling me something that I've never heard of or never thought of. And it's, um, I, I think that's a, a, a fantastic way to not tout yourself as an expert because, um, you know, John C. Maxwell will talk about, uh, you know, he, he says, you know, look, the, the he kind of poo poos the term expert because the expert stops asking questions. They stop listening. They just are talking about what they know. They're, they're, they're an authoritarian, uh, you know, uh, authority on, a, on the space and, and, and there's nothing that, that they are going to learn, right? And, that, and that's dangerous. Mm -hmm. I think it's dangerous in our space. So um, constant learning, I mean, that's kind of the philosophy, that's a culture that we, really foster within. And that's why we've continually gotten excited about new opportunities. Like we've never done this before, or we've done this, but this is just a little different. And, 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 and still, I, I think that's part of it, but, you know, just real quickly going back to like the, the foundation yeah. of any deal is you have to understand the value of the property. You have to understand the paper, so, um, you know, we sometimes call it four of the five P's. There, there are the people involved, there's the property, there's the people, there's the profitability. Um, and, and so really digging into each of those areas, you know, who, the, 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 the people is generally the borrower. So who is the borrower? How do you understand them? I built a great rapport with our borrower on this deal. And the property, we had um, two appraisals and really beat that up in a big way, understood the market uh, like you wouldn't believe. So, um, you know, that, that's, that's drilling down, understanding everything about that market, how many homes are typically for sale, how many, uh, you know, so, so what's the inventory, how many homes are currently uh, on the market, uh, what's the volatility of the market. In a COVID environment like this, you would want to know if you were buying a note and you were really trying to understand the value of a property, you wouldn't want to just look at the last six months or have some, you know, projection about the next six months. You'd want to say, okay, when's the last time we had this level of uncertainty in the market and probably go back to like the great recession. Say what happened in 2008? What happened in 2009? Like did this market get crushed or was it fairly stable? And you'd want to be talking to the right people right? Not somebody that just got their realtor's license and was getting their feet wet in the market, but the, the veteran in that market. So we found that person. The, uh, this individual owned basically 80% of the market as a realtor. They were the authority. They knew everything about this market. So we wanted to know the value. We went to them. They knew this street, knew this property. We picked their brain for several hours. I mean, going back to, you know, discussion about the team, very important. So that was just the valuation piece. I mean, there was the title, there was the insurance. You know, we had a gen, so, so we knew that GenStar insured the property, but we saw, we saw the policy. There were a couple of things that we wanted to know. We wanted to know that the, um, the borrower was insured. We also wanted to know that the lender was the lost payee or additional insured. The more, it had a mortgagee clause, all of that, um, you know, basic stuff. But what about replacement costs? 
a $3.6 million mortgage that has a $2 million insurance policy that, that doesn't line up. It, it, so they could say that, that the replacement costs are 2 million on the property all day long. That's valued at 4.6 million because there's a lot of land and, and that doesn't make its way into a replacement cost, right? The house burns down, you still have the value of the land. That is not acceptable for a note investor that really is covering their bases. So we went and we said, listen, you need to increase the policy a million and a half before we buy the note. And through a lot of follow-up and phone calls and, 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 and encouraging you know, that for the sake of the borrower, because the borrower was underinsured. The current lender that we bought the note from was underinsured. And we said, this is a condition of us buying the note. It's just one of those I's that needed to be dotted, T's that needed to be crossed. So that was a little bit about the insurance, a little bit about the valuation, a little bit about the, I want to just make a point about the borrower as well. So why would you care that the borrower has triplets that are three years old and a fourth daughter that's four or five that likes to ride horses, right? Like what relevance does that have to buying a note? It, it, it boils down to what is their motivation to stay and pay and is this a kind of a somewhat forever home or is it a luxury condo in Miami that's a second home that they don't care about losing, right? It's the psychology of the borrower. Very, very key. I and mean, if you put yourself in, in the, the shoes of that borrower and, and, and you say, how important is this home to me? What will I do to make sure that I pay the obligations and stay in this home? There, there's that level of thinking about the investment that is beyond what a lot of people will do. But it goes back to, again, the deal size. Got to understand it. 